for me. It's, it has to be for you. So let's try this in English. Let us know. We have slides in both, so we can, yeah, we can also print. We can also, yeah, we can send you the presentations in, in, in Indonesian language. So let's just see how it goes and you let us know. Okay? So maybe I'll shut this door. Okay, so the first tool that we're going to talk about this morning, the, the big tool that I want to introduce to you is the Principles for Responsible Contracts. And many people, does anyone in the room know about the Principles for Responsible Contracts? Nobody. The Principles for Responsible Contracts was an addendum to the United Nations Guiding Principles. So when John Ruggie handed in the UN Guiding Principles to the Human Rights Council, this was attached, but it got lost somehow. And there were four addenda to the UN Guiding Principles. This is one of them. There was a study on corporate governance uh, in 47 jurisdictions, I believe. There was a, a paper on conflict. There was um, the pilot project on grievance mechanisms. And, then, and there was also this. Now, the Principles for Responsible Contracts is particularly is, is written for the investment context. Um, and, and this morning we gave you, um, everybody, you got something like this? A beautiful, this is made of, um, this is, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's made of, what's the wood? Uh, uh, bamboo. It's made of bamboo. Yeah, yeah, it's an ecological USB key. Um, and, and on here, you have the document that we submitted to the UN called the Principles for Responsible Contracts, but not only, you also have a whole training program. There's actually a movie on here. If you want to sit and watch a movie on Principles for Responsible Contracts, it's here. Uh, we created it for the Office of the High Commissioner. Uh, it's the, the Office of the High Commissioner has it online, but instead of downloading heavy files, we've given it to you here. So, everything that I'm going to talk about is on there. Um, great. So, let's, let's talk about why did we look at investment contracts. So, um, John Ruggie, in about 2006, we had a, a multi-stakeholder discussion. And there were companies there, there were states there. And there were CSOs there, and we were talking about um, investment and what were the big issues. And to the huge surprise of John Ruggie um, and, and his whole team, I wasn't with his team at the time, um, the discussion focused on something called stabilization clauses. Has anyone ever heard of a stabilization clause? No, okay. So, John Ruggie had not heard of stabilization clauses either before that day, and the debate was absolutely polarized. So, there are companies on one side saying things like, contracts don't kill people, and NGOs on the other side saying, stabilization clauses are the reason we're having so many human rights issues in investment context. And so, the, they were absolutely diametrically opposed to each other the companies and the NGOs, and the whole focus was stabilization clauses. Sitting in the, in, in the multi-stakeholder dialogue that day was the International Finance Corporation. The International Finance Corporation, if you don't know who they are, they are the, the private sector lending arm of the World Bank. So they will give money to the private sector to do investment projects. Okay? So, what IFC said was the International Finance Corporation, IFC, said, well, that's very interesting, this, this debate on stabilization clauses, because we had an issue about stabilization clauses a few years ago on a, a big pipeline called the Baku Tbilisi Chehan Pipeline. Um, that's very interesting that NGOs are so concerned about stabilization and that businesses are so adamant about stabilization clauses don't do any harm. So what, what John Ruggie and IFC decided to do was they decided to actually do an empirical study. And I think one of the important background 
facts about the, the mandate, about the UNGPs and the basis on which the UNGPs are created, is that they were created on a lot of empirical study. Um, and so what IFC and John Ruggie did is they actually contacted me to do that study. And that's how I became, started working for John Ruggie. Because I had done some work on stabilization clauses before. So I was that lucky person to read 88 contracts between states and investors. And what did we do? We took 88 contracts, which one of the other themes that we're going to talk about today is transparency. Generally, these contracts are not transparent. One of the major coups of this research, if we think it's the first one ever done, because contracts are generally confidential, we worked with the World Bank, we worked with several law firms to provide those contracts to us so that we could have the data. And I can't tell you how many people from around the world have asked me for those contracts. Unfortunately, I was under a confidentiality agreement. Those contracts don't you know, we use them for the study and that's it. We couldn't use them for anything else. So it's an unusual study. We were very lucky to be able to do it. Um, and we, we just had redacted contracts, which means um, the names and the, even the country was crossed out. So we don't even know the country. We just know the region of where they were. But we could look at the stabilization clauses. So... Stabilization clauses, so that you can understand the, the results of this research, those are, those, they're clauses that basically say to the investor, um, the changes in law over time won't apply to you. So that's, that's a very basic definition, okay? Um, changes in law over time, and, and it could name even the types of law, it could say, tax law, fiscal policy changes, or it could say, and I've seen them, could say environmental law changes over time won't apply to you. It could say labor law over time won't apply to you, changes over time won't apply to you. And those exist in the world. Um, it can happen in contracts, but just as a note, it can also happen in law. So there are investment policy laws that actually provide stabilization clauses for investors. And, and we'll talk about that also. Um, or it could even happen in treaties. We've, I've seen it, I live in Italy, and actually some old Italian um, investment treaties actually have stabilization clauses for investors in the international. So any investor coming in, basically the laws are stabilized in certain areas for them. Um, and what does that mean from a human rights perspective? So we know from the duty to protect we talked about before that states have to use their policy space to protect human rights. So they have to legislate and regulate and enforce on environment, on labor, on all kinds of areas that can impact human rights. But what happens if you give an exemption to an investor? Then that means the state in that context isn't able to do its job necessarily. Okay, so, and I'm, I'm simplifying, we can talk about the nuances around that, but just to give you the idea of what stabilization clauses can do. So, from a human rights perspective, the NGOs in that consultation were extremely worried because they said, if, if under human rights law, states are supposed to do X, Y, Z and protect human rights, but yet in their investment contracts, they're signing away their ability to do it, then we have a problem, right? So we wanted to understand, well, do stabilization clauses really say this stuff? Do they really give these rights to investors? And how widespread is this? Where, where does this exist in the world? So we looked at these contracts, and we, we found, actually, that the world splits in two. We looked at mining, oil and gas, energy, infrastructure, telecom. So we looked across sectors, and we found that as a general rule, the world is in two. You can look at contracts for major investments in OECD countries. You do not find, you find stabilization clauses, but they're written in a different way. You do not find exemptions for social and environmental laws. And the, the mitigate for new laws when they come into place, there are 
um, all kinds of formula created to, pr to protect the state's right to regulate, the state's right to implement the regulations on the investor. So in certain industries like toll, toll roads or railroads where you have fixed tariffs, um, there are mitigation measures to help the investor deal with new regulations because they can only charge so much for the toll road, they can only charge so much for the, for the um, train ticket. So they have risk sharing in OECD countries. Um, and they do all kinds of other things, but the state never provides an exemption. So there's no question that new regulations and new laws, there's no question that the investor has to comply. That's absolutely sure. Then you come to non-OECD countries. And what we found, quite differently, was that the majority of contracts restricted the ability of the state to apply new social or environmental legislation to investment projects or required compensation to the investor. Now what does that mean? It means, it, and often the formula was basically the investor said, okay, you want us to put new scrubbers on our, on our factory? This is how much it's going to cost us. And they, would, they can put a bill to the state. And the state, by contract, has to pay. So in non-OECD countries, what we found was the rule were exemptions or compensation directly from the state for what the investor would say is cost. And often here, often here you didn't even have a process by which you had an independent expert saying how much it really would cost. You didn't even have requirements that the investor had to mitigate costs. So basically, you know, just sending a bill basically to the state. Now what can that do in terms of the state, you know, maybe it's easier for the state instead of paying that bill to just say, for, forget that rule, right? So what we found in non-OECD countries actually is that in, most, in the, most of the contracts we looked at, we had a human rights problem in those contracts with the stabilization clause because the state, in those instances, wouldn't be able to necessarily use all of its tools to protect human rights, <coughs> okay? So I'll just give you a few examples because it starts to get you thinking along the lines of what the stabilization clause is. So the, the I guess you could call it the worst stabilization clause we found, um, was actually in a World Bank project. Um, and it was in Mozambique, it was for the Mosul um, aluminum smelter. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Mosul project. But that, that contract um, had, it was a 50-year contract, and it was renewable by the choice of the investor. So a one-sided renewal. If the investor liked that contract, they could then go ahead for another 50 years. And that stabilization clause blocked all laws whatsoever, all judicial decisions, Every law of the state was stabilized, which meant you could have an aluminum smelter operating for 50 if the investor decided 100 years without the obligation to apply new labor law, new environmental law, new health and safety. It's, it's you know, unbelievable, actually, um, with this law. And so I went, when I was doing the research, I went and I talked with people in the World Bank that supported that project. And I said, well, you know, I'm looking at the stabilization clause here and I'm really confused because this is a World Bank project, so what about the stabilization clause? Well, the response of those within the World Bank who supported that project were, what they told me was that, oh, stabilization clauses, those are what we call in English boilerplate. You know, it's just a, a rubber thing you just put in the contract, it doesn't mean anything. But what I actually found in the research was that the contracts, there was no one single formula for, for stabilization clauses. They were all very different and specific to the project, which tells you what? It tells you that those are highly negotiated clauses. Those are clauses that are very important. They are not boilerplate. They're very important to the investor. And in fact, when you speak with investors, and I spoke with a lot of investors over the years around stabilization, what they'll tell you is that is core, core for them. So there was a, 
there was a lack of awareness also on the World Bank side and on IFC side, I think, um, about the importance of stabilization clauses. And the human rights and stabilization clauses work actually started bringing this to light. That we have a big problem here around exemptions for investors that's not being dealt with. So, um, what did we do in the mandate? What did we, we took the stabilization clause in human rights research and we used it as a platform to have discussions around the world on investment contracts and human rights. We talked with companies, with states, with negotiators, lawyers, we talked with civil society. We had a lot of conversations. Because what we were thinking was, well, should we come up with a model stabilization clause? Should we advocate for what stabilization clause should be, or that they shouldn't be, that they shouldn't exist? Um, and the, the interesting and surprising thing that came out of this was that when we talked with people around investment contracts and human rights, they didn't only want to talk about stabilization clauses. They started talking about all kinds of other things that were absolutely key to human rights and related to investment contracts. So they started talking about transparency first. They started talking about the lack of requirements around consultation in the contracts, the lack of um, integration of good standards on environment and social. Um, Issues. They started talking about all of the community projects that, um, that are often inserted into these contracts. So the investor will also build a school, the investor will also build a hospital. But the fact that connected with those projects, they often, they don't even have to abide by building codes and standards. So it's, it's considered a philanthropy project, so it's not considered even regulated by local law. And we actually saw examples of that then. I mean, in, in contracts, and I did a project in, in Laos, and I saw examples where you don't have even local regulation attached to philanthropy projects. So, what we decided to do, instead of write a model contract on, or a model stabilization clause, what we decided to do is actually take the UN guiding principles, the state duty to protect, and the corporate responsibility to respect, and we decided to say, well, what is, what is the conversation, if we take the UNGPs, what is the conversation that should happen between a state and the investor before they do an investment project? What should that conversation include? What are the issues around human rights that should be dealt with? Right at the beginning of a project, when you're dealing with the contract stage, the negotiation stage, when you're talking about industries like this, infrastructure, mining, agriculture, oil and gas, big footprint projects. So what, what the principles for responsible contracts is, is about that discussion. What is that discussion supposed to entail? What are the issues? Because our idea was, and, and this is something that, that came out of all of our consultation, companies said, we don't talk about human rights at the negotiating stage. It's not, definitely not on our negotiator's checklist. The states often do not talk about human rights. At the most, they'll agree. Maybe some companies are now saying, oh, we want to append all these um, voluntary standards to the back of the contract. Maybe that comes up. But, but companies are very scared to talk with states about human rights because they feel like they might offend them. States definitely don't talk about human rights because they also want to be welcoming to the investor and they don't feel that this is a necessarily the right conversation. So the conversation's not happening even though when I, we had a, a big forum with all kinds of states, attorneys general from, from several, and this was a forum in Africa, we had um, 12 African countries around and we had their attorneys general, their ministries of justice, we had all kinds of people involved in the negotiation of contracts and after the three days of working together, they said, you know, all of these issues are really important to us, but it's very hard for us to bring this up to investors. And if we just knew that investors would entertain these kinds of conversations, it would be a lot easier. So our idea was, let's put it down on paper. Let's, let's say, here's what you should be discussing. It's got buy-in from companies. It's got buy-in from states. It's got buy-in from NGOs. So hopefully what the principles that you have on that key is a tool 
where you can try and start the right conversations early in an investment. So the idea is early identification and early management of human rights risks. This is absolutely key. Establishing clear roles and responsibilities within, not necessarily only within the contract, but also referring to, to national law. Um, helping the parties, see, parties assess potential impacts and make cost and timing allocations. This is something that, that companies have told us is a major issue for them because when they have a human rights problem, the solution to that problem or how they deal with it is all thought of in terms of what they're required to do by their contract. Often timing and their budget will cut short many of, their, of the better ideas for how to deal with human rights issues. So you've got to do it up front, and it should facilitate cooperation and better management of impacts between the state and the company, but also communities. And the idea is that it increases the overall positive benefits of the project, including the human rights. So that's the idea of what we're trying to do in the Principles for Responsible Contracts. Pre-negotiation, that you identify potential human rights impacts, you codify those, and you codify mitigation mechanisms in the contract. During project implementation, then you can further define and implement mechanisms, and then you have better project outcomes. Mitigating, avoiding mitigating and remediating human rights impacts. So, because what we learned um, often is that early planning isn't done on human rights issues for investment contract for investment projects. So early planning is key. You have to take financial, legal, and administrative considerations into account. And then planning has to relate explicitly to preventing, and mitigating, and ensuring remediation of human rights impacts. That's just something, you know, when I, still when I talk with companies or people who work for companies around investment contracts, and I say, well, how much is human rights discussions, how much is human rights integrated in that legal agreement? It, they often even laugh, right? It's just not. It's just not the way things are done. So the Principles for Responsible tra Contracts is trying to change that. It's a tool to change that, but we're at zero still. Um, one few things that I want you to know about the principles is that um, the tool gives you key implications for the negotiation. So it says what the negotiator should be tasked with. It, it has a negotiator's checklist. It explains each issue. But importantly, this does not dictate terms. So it's not a, a tool that advocates can take and say, OK, make this contract compliant with principles for responsible contracts. Because it's about, also about the discussion that has to happen. But it doesn't tell you what exactly should be in every contract. I don't know this. OK. Um, so let me just, are there any questions before I tell you then the 10 principles? Are there any questions so far? Okay. So the first, where does the principles for responsible contract start? It starts with the negotiations, preparation, and planning. So what we found out um, in, our, in our work is that basically <coughs> states are not even asking the question, what are the human rights risks with this investment? How much is it going to cost me to mitigate? Um, and, and how are we going to plan for that? So they don't even know what the cost of the project is to them. So it's very hard to really measure the benefit also. So I'll give you a quick example. So one of the projects I saw in Laos was, um, there was there was a major investment in the country. And there was not enough workforce to handle the project. So everyone knew that. They did not have enough labor force to actually do the project. What they could project, and the company projected, was that they were going to have an influx of 50,000 people, generally Chinese, they thought, 50,000 people in one area of the country. That area of the country did not have regular police force, did not have hospitals, did not have schools, did not have any public services. So 50,000 people coming in, and there was nothing there. That's a huge cost for a country to manage. And that cost was not calculated in the negotiation in terms of what was then the benefit of that investment. 
And that cost basically was just externalized <laughs> to, the, to the project itself. What happened was they ended up with a big mess. Not only the investor, but also the state ended up with a big mess. And it ended up being costly and also not to mention all of the human rights implications of, of those people coming in, right? 50,000 mainly men into, into rural areas with no administration whatsoever. So the idea is that when you start the negotiations and when the, when the investment is still in the design and idea stage, that you've got to understand what are the implications, right? And on both sides, because it can't be that you rely on the company to tell you. Often the company won't be able to measure all of the implications for the state on that side. So it's preparation, both the company and the state. Uh, right, Andrea, yeah. can I ask questions actually regarding principle one? Yeah. Uh, it says there are the parties. So who are they? Basically, is the state and investors, and is there any possibility for the third party, you know, to be included in the in the contracts or you know during the negotiations? So that's a great question. Is there a role for third parties? In the principles for responsible contracts, it is not foreseen that you would have third parties at the table, and there are, there are a few reasons for that. Um, one, well, one, it's it's not necessarily practicable that you would have third parties sitting at the table. However, as you'll see later, um, when the parties come to the negotiation table, there should have been prior consultation and engagement with the communities and areas that would be affected. Right? So there's got to be a knowledge based on actually engaging with people and communities and understanding the context in order to enter into the negotiation. And that's often hard, um, also because what companies and states will tell you is that often we don't even know what the parameters of the project are or even necessarily the, the definite regions until we sit down at the negotiating table. So there's, there has to be some flexibility there. Um, right? They don't even know what the activities might necessarily be because that also could be for negotiation. Um, but the idea is that yes, the impacts have to be looked at, but they wouldn't, the third parties wouldn't be at the table. And, and I'll mention Later on, we're going to talk about Principle 9, which is talking about grievance mechanisms for third parties. When we started engaging with states and companies on the idea that in a contract, you should discuss, or in the contract negotiation, you should discuss having grievance mechanisms for people impacted by the project, their eyes just went, why? What? Why? Those are third party rights. You can't put it into a contract. It was, it was absolutely a surprise and a shock to them even to have something like that represented in a contract. Um, so having third parties at the table, it's, it's not really practicable when you think about how investment contracts happen. The parties just wouldn't, the two parties I don't think would accept it. It's, it's a good advocacy <laughs> position, but it wasn't right for this. Uh, another question, uh, sorry, uh, I'm not really, I'm an office to this uh, investor and investment uh, issue. Just another question is like, when, when it comes based on your experiences basically, uh, when basically the contracts um, um, starts, you know, the negotiations, is it like earlier before even uh, the company basically go into a certain country or after there are certain necessary uh, effort was already invested there, for example, as you mentioned before, uh, you know the, the negotiations with the uh, with the people uh, impacted uh, people, or it's just in the middle, or after all uh, the assessment done, and then that's the contract starts. Yeah, it it, it changes for um, well every country is different, but it also changes by sector. It changes by the individual ministry. So we saw in Colombia that the actual first concession is made online. Um, and and then you can enter. We, I saw I saw in Laos that actually there were three different ways that investors could actually enter onto land. The three ministries actually disagreed on what that meant, but the three ministries could give uh, memorandums of understanding allowing the investor to actually start work on the land, and that was before the contract is actually signed. So, it, it, go ahead. Do you want to say? <coughs> Uh, no, so I was going to say it's really different. So it's one thing, it's something to understand in each context, 
about how you can advocate that these principles are integrated. So, and it's a very good question in the sense also that it triggers you to think when this needs to happen, and that was the exercise actually that we had with the Colombian uh, government officials because they had not realized the importance of having this discussion before they even yeah. gave the, give the, the concession. So in the mining sector, as things ha happen in Colombia, now it's getting a bit better, but like five years ago, when the government decided that mining was the key for the economy, uh, what was happening is that any person who thought that there could be a mineral somewhere in the country could go with the ID and say, I think there is a mineral from here to there to there. And then basically a license was granted, right? What happens is that then the investor or the person that was the, the license had to go and obtain the environmental uh, license, which included an environmental impact assessment and something called socialization, which was kind of like it. But that's too late because the terms, or at least the economic terms, had already been granted, right? And that means that. Once you get as an investor uh, a knowledge about the environmental issues and a knowledge about the social issues, the human rights risk, then that costs money. And that needs to be factored in from the very beginning uh, negotiations. So that was a very interesting process to actually think, okay, so when is that that I need to be doing these things? Right? And when then does this signature or this concession of the license come? So that's, I think, is a very, very good question. Okay. Can I just, uh, regarding to principle one, because you mentioned here, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm asking again, I'm just, um, here the formulations of the principle one basically is that uh, properly address the human rights implications. So in the essence, uh, I was, uh, 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 in other words, basically the principle suggests that the, some preparation has to be done earlier and before even going for negotiations, I guess. Am I, am I right? Or am I yeah, right? and I'm not, I'm not reading to you all of the implications, but in the document it, it teases out what does this mean, okay. right? So the state should enter the negotiation with a clear idea of how the project's objectives, opportunities, and risks relate to its own obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. The business investors should enter the negotiation with a clear idea of how the project's object, objectives, opportunities, and risks relate to their responsibility to respect human rights. Um, the parties should enter into the negotiation aiming to ensure that adverse impacts are prevented, mitigated, and remedied throughout the project's life cycle. So it sets out what it means. Um, and then it has the, the checklist for negotiators. But the idea is here, and, and states and, and companies will tell you when you say this principle to them, they'll say, but it's impossible, we can't know everything. Yeah. That's fine, but start the conversation and put in together mechanisms or platforms on which you can then further discuss issues as they arise. And also, how you can build in flexibility, both on the economic side, so what can count as a cost for the investor, but also on the timing side, so that they have time to properly manage the risks. So, and we hear over and over again from, from companies that, you know, they run into a human rights problem, but they have budget constraints and they have timing constraints. And that dictates how they deal with it, <laughs> right? And, so, and that's where we can get into, into issues. So it's that you're setting up a mechanism, right? You have at least some sort of idea of potentials, and then you're setting up a, a platform on which to deal with the issues. One single thing uh, in addition to that um, is that at least the government needs to have a basic information and in particular, and I, say, I know that this is an issue here at land, and that's what we saw, for example, with these contracts and these licenses in Colombia. The government was giving away these licenses without even having the knowledge or the minimum understanding of what was happening with this land. And what we are discovering now is that this land was actually belonging to displaced communities or actually was in some kind of specific problem or process, and that, that again, is, is, is too late when the, the thing has given uh, away. And then we're going to see in the second part how this might have an impact in terms of investment uh, litigation. So under the treaty, we will see how this might actually trigger a possible uh, uh, claim against the state for not managing these things uh, uh, properly. And, and what the governments, at least in the African forum that we did, what the governments admitted was that often um, investors come to them with a project, so they're completely caught off guard and they don't 
they don't have any idea about the risk, but they want to start negotiating. Um, or literally areas of land are given away for concessions, but there's been no study whatsoever about who might be impacted by that. So we just see it over and over and again. And this is coming back to the active role of the state that we talked about before. So the active role of the state in investment means knowing what the risks are. Also so you can do a better negotiation, right, from the state's point of view. Um, a better negotiation. And, you know, the, the, the problem is not just within human rights. I mean, one of the major problems that we, we see worldwide in extractive industries is that um, governments also don't know how to value the assets that they have. So they're not even doing, you know, the, the core things. So we need them also to, to understand the risk. There are huge obstacles in the way. But So if they're not even doing the core work of valuing their assets before they're negotiating, you know, we're a long way away from getting them to deal with human rights risk. But it's, it's something that the Principles for Responsible Contracts is trying to push. is the awareness of government as well as investors that there may be, there may be uh, some implications on human rights violations or whatever. Uh, have you ever, ever found, uh, or, or do you have any suggestion or a recommendation of a standard, well, not a standard clause, but a clause in, in the investment agreement between state and investors that has something to do with that? Just in case, let's say, if the government doesn't really know the impact but they are aware of this principal one. So is there any clause that can be put into the contract that, that will uh, at least protect this? Yeah, so this is principle one about the negotiation, and then we're going to see later principles that are going to talk about how do you integrate human rights risk management actually into the clauses of the contract. Yes, yes. So let's go to number two. So the idea with number two, and it, for for. For human rights advocates, it doesn't seem strange, but actually ensuring that the management of potential and adverse human rights impacts is integrated into the contract um, and making sure that those are clarified and agreed at the time of the negotiation, that is very new. It is not done. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, as an advisor to, to companies, I mean, I know the kinds of things that they deal with at negotiation, and I know where they are more or less today um, in terms of thinking about human rights. And still, for example, when you're talking about decommissioning mining sites and decommissioning oil and gas sites, still the social implications of decommissioning and the social implications of, of shutting down those sites, the human rights considerations, they are still not yet fully on the radar screen of companies and certainly not in governments. So for when we're talking about looking at the management of potential adverse human rights impacts throughout the, the project life cycle and thinking about who's going to be responsible for what at, up front, that is very new. <laughs> it's not done. So, so principle two is saying this is before the contract is finalized, you need to be a, clarifying and agreeing how are those impacts going to be managed. Okay. Principle three is about project operating standards. So this was a, this was a quite difficult principle to get to um, because what, what companies were saying to us was, listen, you know, we have to abide by IFC standards. We have to abide by equator principle standards. We have all these voluntary standards you know, in our own principles. So what we want to do in the contracts is we want to say, this is what we're going to abide by. right? And also, this is much better for human rights, um, and this is much better because it's better than local law. What, what states were saying is we want investors to abide by domestic law. Right? <coughs> And then we would say, well, the companies say that they want to have better standards. They want to have X, Y, Z. But what does that do? When you start, even at IFC standards, and I have, you know, one of the reflections that this project made me come to, you know, there's a lot of advocacy around IFC performance standards. Maybe you've heard of those. You know, one of the issues, though, with IFC performance standards is that state regulators don't know IFC performance standards, and they're not, their KPIs, their own job is not to enforce IFC performance standards. So what do you do when you actually append the, the private company 
obligation or you know their their undertaking to abide by IFC to abide by best international practice you're taking the regulation of the project out of the hand of the state regulator right and you're saying okay well it's this other standard the state regulators may not even be familiar with so how do they regulate that project so it's a very difficult issue when you don't have local the, the domestic standards that are up to par to protect human rights and they don't have you don't have adequate safe, safety and health or it's the country's first project of a certain sector and they don't have enough domestic law in place but what we don't want to do with this idea of project operating standards is just adopt one-sided commitments on the private sector side leaving the state regulator out of the, the equation. So what do we say here is that the laws, regulations, and standards governing the project should facilitate prevention, mitigation, and remediation of any negative human rights impacts throughout the life cycle of the project. And in the principles we discuss, the idea, okay, where you have domestic law that is not up to par, the contract could be a place where you could add additional standards. But that should be a temporary stopgap measure for better legislation, right? For better domestic law that applies to all investors. Because the other problem that you have when you have a contract having specific standards is that it's a huge burden for the state administratively to regulate that. So I'll give you an example. In, in Kazakhstan, um, there was a, they had this stabilization law. And they said basically when the investor comes in, the laws in place at that time apply to that project for the life of the project. So what a, an oil company told me was that you had environmental regulators coming to them and saying, oh, you're not applying this rule. And they said, well, we entered the, con we entered the country in, on, in 1998, not now. We have to apply those rules. So the environmental ministry and the, those regulators had to apply different rules for every single investor. So you entered in 1998. Okay, what was the 1988 rule around uh, getting rid of water waste? Okay, well, you're a different investor. So what was the 2000 rule about this? It was absolutely impossible. And, it was a, and what this oil company told me was that it was a formula for corruption. It, because things were so complicated that they couldn't deal with it. And so it was just an invitation to corruption for the local regulators. But, and it was a huge burden for the administration of, of environmental rules, social rules. It was, it was terrible for the state. So we have to get out of, I know a lot of um, contract advocates around the world like to see huge per, um, a promotion of a lot of new rules in contracts. But we have to think about what that means if we want an active state regulating. It can create real burdens. So the contract is a good stopgap place for additional standards when you really need them. But the goal should be getting these into legislation. Okay? Um, so number four on stabilization clauses. So the, the principles have a lot of guidance here on stabilization clauses. So we're not going to go through it all, but what the principle here is that con contractual stabilization clauses, if they are used, should be carefully drafted so that any protections for investors against future changes in the law do not interfere with the state's bona fide efforts to implement laws, regulations, or policies in a non-discriminatory manner in order to meet its human rights obligations. We wrote this extremely careful with a lot of consultation from companies and states. And companies who are interested in, in their responsibility or respect are fine with this. And then the, the principles lay out a lot of other advice in terms of ring fencing, and making sure that the state has its policy space within human rights areas, environment, labor, social issues. And then number five talks about additional goods or service provision. Because what we discovered in contracts was maybe I had an agricultural contract that was this thick. And maybe three-fourths of it were about projects that the company had to execute for the community. 
not having to do with the actual investment. So not mitigating issues, but just other <coughs> infrastructure or services that the state was asking the company to do. But, oops, Andrew. But what was... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but what was the problem with the additional goods and services? As I mentioned before, often those additional goods and services were falling outside domestic law. So they were philanthropy projects where you had no regulation, not even a statement that those had to be done within the, the parameters of domestic law. And why, why did we see that? And I think the reason we saw those kinds of rules in contracts is because there was a, there's a confusion about the role of the state and a confusion about the role of companies. And the UNGPs helps us here. So the role of the state, right, they have human rights obligations, protect, respect, fulfill, promote. Those obligations don't go away just when they contract with a private entity for services, right? They still have to <coughs> fulfill their role. They still have to stay in the regulator's seat. And, and I think often there's a confusion there. Okay, it's a philanthropy project. We'll just take what the, the company is going to offer, and we're not going to regulate that. And at the same time, the principles, the UN guiding principles, tell us what this company's role is in a philanthropy project. Right? What is the, the UNGPs don't say, apply responsibly or respect when you're doing your core business, but don't worry about philanthropy projects. It's any business activity. So if you are building a school, a hospital, a road, and it's a philanthropy project, a CSR project, you still have to respect human rights. So all the risks that you're looking at, the mitigation, the, the mitigation measures, the remediation measures for projects should also apply to those special services projects. Okay, so we saw a real confusion of roles there when we stepped into the philanthropy area. Okay, and physical security for the project, and I think this is probably one of the, one of an important one in Indonesia. Um, when, when we talked with companies and states about what are the issues that should be represented in the principles for responsible contracts, nobody mentioned this. And we were absolutely shocked. We said, okay states, give us your, your list of issues that we would put in the principles for responsible contracts. And they talked about stabilization, they talked about project operating standards, they talked about all kinds of things. And the companies as well. Nobody mentioned physical security. And we said, well that's really interesting because from a human rights perspective, one of the first things we think of is physical security for the project and what does it do, what, what are the risks then for the communities around the project. After we started discussing it, then people said, oh yeah, actually, that's quite interesting. And we had some examples, in particular in Liberia, we had some examples where companies and states had integrated, for example, compliance with voluntary principles on security and human rights. We had some examples that we could take and show states and companies the value of the discussion that can be had if you talk about physical security. Um, so number six is in that discussion, you've got to be talking about physical security. And it's not just, okay, we need physical security, okay, who's going to do it? It's also, how are we going to deal with local police or local army officials from the national level, the regional level, how are we going to what role is the state going to play? What role is the company going to play in, in facilitating dialogue on these issues? How is the contract going to be? Is it going to be an MOU between local officials, the government, the national government, and the, and the company? All of those things actually should be discussed. So one of, the, one of the obstacles that companies have told us about is they say, okay, yes, we agree with the, the national government, but then we have local police officials who aren't trained in human rights, they're not trained in international humanitarian law, and so we have to deal with that because that's a risk for us. But yet, we don't have support from the government to actually do those trainings, and we would really like that support. Or, for example. So there are all kinds of dynamics there um, in terms of how do you how do you establish a relationship around physical security? How do you establish 
those agreements and also training if needed. Um, and that should happen actually at the contract negotiation stage. And we want to we want to push that discussion up front. Roy, you look puzzled. No, no. Um, number seven is community engagement, and so uh, apart from um, law, apart from domestic law, so we were dealing in Colombia where the, the law is around community engagement only applies to indigenous populations. So what we're saying is in the contract, in the contract negotiation, you should have a community engagement plan. Now, maybe it doesn't go into the contract, maybe it's a, an addendum, maybe it's a side agreement, but there has to be a plan. And that plan should be discussed at the negotiation stage. And the other thing that should happen there, and it's in the, is that the state should be talking with the investor about what was the prior engagement that they had. Did they have any engagement with those populations, and where does that stand? Because one of the things that we heard from investors is that they're not getting information from the state. So they go in blind, and the state says, okay, go do your engagement, and then they back away. Um, and the investor doesn't even know what has happened in the, in the past, right? So community engagement has to be part of that discussion, and there should be a plan. And then project monitoring. So we, we also found out that um, states aren't doing monitoring. So we had an example from, uh, from, I mean, they're not doing monitoring even on core issues. We had an example of one of the attorneys general from an African country that said, you know, we, um, we don't invest in monitoring, we never thought it was actually worth our while, even on how much money the company's making. So, you know, the core thing, right? We get our taxes from how much the company's making, and we never estimated, we actually took their estimates. And one, one day we found out there was a, a company um, from from the UK, actually, a mining company, that said that they didn't have any profits in our country. So they, they paid no corporations tax. But then we saw in the stock market their discussion, their statement that said that they had a lot of profits in our country. So then we decided to invest in auditing to understand. And actually, it pays off to do some monitoring and auditing. So what we saw is an absence of the state, even in the core areas of monitoring projects, and certainly not in, in human rights issues. Um, and one of the issues that at least developing countries would say to us was we don't have the capacity to be monitoring. So in the principles for responsible contracts we also suggest well there can be community monitoring, there can be all kinds of, there can be self-monitoring as a stopgap measure, there can be community monitoring as a stopgap measure. You can, you can figure out ways to deal with that capacity problem that doesn't just leave no monitoring. Right? But the principle is that things should be monitored. And and that the human rights issues and the human rights impact should be monitored. Okay, and then this is the one that I was telling you was so controversial. Um, but, but they came around. Um, and that is that individuals and communities impacted by the project, but not party to the contract, should have access to an effective non-judicial grievance mechanism. So why is that, why does it not talk about state mechanism? Because we're talking about the agreement between the state and the company. So it's not the place to talk about what the state. Of course, the state should give judicial and non-judicial mechanisms. But the discussion that has to happen in the negotiation is about the non-grievance, the non-judicial grievance mechanism. Okay, and that, that, I'm sorry, that could be state-based, but it could also be private. But the thing is that the discussion has to happen. There has to be an agreement that they need it. And they have to figure out a plan for it. And then finally, transparency, disclosure of contract terms. And is, is uh, Indonesia EITI? Is Indonesia? Okay. So you're already dealing with here transparency. It might be something that we think about for the NAP if they're already an EITI country. Um, but certainly, transparency of contracts has moved along a lot in the last few years. <coughs> more and more states are actually publishing their contracts online. Um, and they're much more open. That was not the case when we were doing this. Um, and now there's a big push for transparency. But what we're saying is quite very strongly that the contract terms should be disclosed. 
And you have to have compelling justifications for holding back information. Because what companies and states will tell you will there be certain things that will hurt our next negotiation if we let it out. Well, that's fine. Then you withhold it until the next negotiation. And then you reveal it. But there, but specific terms, and those can be specific financial terms. But the stuff that human rights people will be interested in will often not be those commercial terms. Will often be what monitoring do you have in place? What are the operating standards? How often do do you have a community engagement plan, etc.? So the principles call for disclosure of contract terms. So are there any questions? Because what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and talk about, oh, and not a break. You can go if you want to have a quick coffee and take it back to the room so that you keep awake for the next hour, because it's, uh, it's going to be the key hour. But uh, just, just to get the coffee and, and come in. Yeah, just come in.